She's my sister, by the way. Um, you're the Minister of Environment of Egypt, and last year you had COP27. I want to ask you, as a sister, what advice would you give the UAE in preparing now for the few months that are coming ahead of us? Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency Mariam. It's really a pleasure to be here again and again and again, every time. Um, uh, organizing a COP is a huge thing. Uh, and organizing a COP in those years, in 2022, 2023, and even beyond, becomes harder every year. I do envy those who had prepared COPs before us, because the supply chain, the logistics, the organization, even the, the difficulty and complexity of handling the climate change as a topic within uh, um, years that we are all suffering from food security, from uh, energy security, from geopolitics coming out of the pandemic. The most important advice I would give to UEE is uh, an excellent organization, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, would uh, mean including everyone in that process. Uh, in Egypt, and especially that for organizing a COP, you know, for climate, it's, diff it's different than the biodiversity or desertification because those come every two years or three years, so you have quite a good time to prepare. But 11 months to prepare for that is really a very short time. A successful COP is not a successful COP when it starts and when it ends. And I don't see it even only in the decisions of the UNFCCC because all decisions have been made since Paris, but there's no actual implementation on the ground. The actual implementation comes by the people and for the people. And for that, I always say that a successful COP comes when the country responsible for the organization put the people at the heart of that. And what you have started to do since you announced uh, the president designee in the sustainability week is indeed a great job because you have been doing so much session and dialogues you've been discussing everything around the climate direct or indirect so keep doing this intensify the stakeholder consultation and participation and dialogue be more focused on what will be the themes of the thematic days and what will be the outcomes and who will be contributing to that. That would really make a huge difference for a cup other than the decisions. So, Your Excellency, I know um, going towards COP27, you did a lot of initiatives for Africa. You led an adaptation initiative. You also led a renewable energy initiative. And um, we're here talking about food systems transformation. What do you think would be the biggest obstacle to transforming the food systems into more sustainable ones? I think that one most important difficult, beside the, the issues that are technical like climate and droughts and deforestation and so forth, is the culture and the practices. In Egypt, when we even worked with the FAO, I'm, I'm happy that Al Hakim is here, that uh, the, on the FAST initiative, it did not specify the actual things that we all know about the finance, the capacity development, the technology transfer, although that these are very important pillars for the food transformation. But we aim on the FAST initiative is to have that holistic approach on how can we walk the talk together, how can we move into that. The culture and the practices is very much realistic, like you've mentioned in your opening speech, is who is producing the food, how we are consuming the food, how we're dealing with the waste, and how we're closing that circle. And I think that even when we plan that many initiatives, like you mentioned, Your Excellency, on the food, like the fast, we even wanted to copy that with the waste initiative of 50 by 2050. So I think that working on the culture and the practices, and I'll give you a very good example of that, a tip of advice that you will be facing, but I need to, to say it out loud. When Abdel Hakim was coming to my office and we started working on the, or even before the fast, this is a cup for implementation when we had the COP27, and I was very keen uh, and I have my colleague responsible for that, being here with me in UEE, that the, in the conference itself, we need to promote for the low carbon food. 
We cannot keep negotiating climate change and saying mitigation and adaptation and people coming out of the rooms eating the regular foods that they're eating. So what kind of implementation are we doing? This is an important f f factor that I think if UEE would really try to build on that, on the wonderful initiative of the AIM, I know that you are a, a big fan of the food system, even three years ago before the UEE would take over the COP presidency. If we were able to translate that into practical implementation on the ground, you started by the farmers, you'll deal with the food waste, you try to change the practices, all this will make really a huge difference in the way of overcoming that challenge. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for sharing that. And um, so, I, you know, I had to think a lot with, um, with the team when we were talking about food systems transformation in the UAE. Especially the UAE is a country that imports a lot of its food. 90% of our food is imported. And uh, when you think of food security, most people don't understand that food security is about the access of food. It's not necessarily agriculture. Yeah. And um, so when we try to focus on how we can build or more local produce, but build it in a sustainable way and think of technologies and innovations, what we noticed is the blueprint of the country is actually not made to uh, grow a lot of food. So the policies are more for trade and not for growing food. So we had to do a lot of inwards searching inside our own policies and understand what are the uh, kind of bottlenecks that we have that we have to change. And this was, I'm talking about a country now that has leadership, we have funding, we have the resources. And I just think there are so many countries for them to take that step and understand their landscape and understand what are their barriers, it's a long way to go. And we really have to, and this is why it's so important that we help each other in, in the kind of technologies. And I really, what's amazing to see is that many technologies now from the UAE are going, are being exported. Some of our uh, companies now are going to uh, Saudi, they're going to Singapore, they're going to Malaysia. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about some specific initiatives and programs that have been successful, successful in promoting uh, sustainable agriculture in in yeah. the country. Uh, one, two things, two things that I always remember, the credit lines for the small farmers, that was extremely, extremely important because that program, when we started that, enabled many of the farmers to have access to land and they would have access to the capital and they would ensure a sustainable financial flow, especially with the de-risking of the climate impacts on their crops. This is one part that we've been working on. Another part is, you know, Egypt was very famous long time ago with the Egyptian cotton. And because of the impact of the climate change and the scarcity of water, similar to the UEE, we were not able to give that full production of the crops as we were trying to do a few years ago. So we started a project in Upper Egypt in order to promote and have more cultivation of the cotton, but we've linked that to the industry at, at itself. Yesterday, our Prime Minister was uh, launching and integrating our biggest firm for Egyptian cotton, uh, and this is in itself is important to link the agricultural part to the industry but ensure that the technology and the new risking against the impact of the climate and the water scarcity is an integral part of that. Another important agricultural initiative that we've just started because of the higher price for the, the, the eggs and the chicken that we're suffering on from Egypt right now, and we have to import a lot of animal feeding, and that takes a lot of money. We've started our own project, our own pilot project, of the reuse of the agriculture waste, mixing it with some other uh, additives, so that it will act as a local animal feed, especially for the chicken. And this is in itself, you're solving here two problems, a supply problem, 
and you're trying to decrease the, the way you're trying to import the animal feed from abroad. And another thing is that you're getting rid of the agricultural waste. And the third thing, you're providing another job opportunity through a credit line for the farmers to reuse the agricultural waste and make a new product. So m my thing is that initiatives alone will never live if it doesn't touch the people, if it's not linked on agriculture and industry, even when you're talking about the wonderful berries, I've tasted them, by the way, yesterday, <laughs> uh, because Miriam has been telling me about that, about the wonderful berries. These in itself, the packing itself and selling that, that's related to the industry, so it's still part of that. So these are three important local initiatives that we're trying to replicate and upscale. And, and believe me, the more you have challenges, the more we as ministers of environment get our challenges into opportunities for others. And that maybe is the beauty of, of being a minister of environment. No, it is, it is. And, you know, we also talk about, um, for example, there's a, the, the nexus <coughs> of food, energy, water. That nexus also plays a huge role in food systems transformation. Maybe just want to explain a little bit how that role comes into the food systems transformation. Um, water, food and energy, for me, that's the very close friend to my heart because when Egypt was preparing its strategy, its NDC, our first package of what we call the Nuafi was water, food and energy. You know that even at the level of the climate, when we start discussing energy, you have a very great appetite for that. And the great appetite for that because they're bankable. They, they are easy, they are a quick win, and we have a, a, a bunch of private sector that would go into that. But when you talk about water and food, that's the thing that is always left behind. Water, food, and energy would be an excellent example of resolving the issue of food security and food transformation. How would we do that? If we're able to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy, even if small ones, not really big ones, and use that renewable energy for water desalination, and then you use the water for the food, that would help opening more job opportunities in different sector, multiple scale. You will do that kind of mitigation and adaptation balance, but what is more important is that you will find a quick transformation in the way we are consuming the food and the way there are more opportunities for job at different sectors for technology. So if we were able to think beyond water and food and energy as just a program into a very holistic approach that could be implemented on the ground, I think that would really make a huge difference. You know, you said something about consumers. I think there's a lot going on on, on the production side, on distribution, but I think as consumers, we're all consumers here, there's still a huge effort we need to do on how we eat. And I think a lot of us are very guilty of this. I'm guilty of it myself. Um, you know, just the stressful lifestyle and what we eat. And, uh, and of course, there's so much information on the net on how we should eat, what lifestyle we should follow, what diet we should follow. Um, but I think we have to all realize that whatever we eat, we're actually pulling on the food systems. And it's so important that we pull it in the right direction. And really think about, okay, I'm, I'm eating these tomatoes because tomatoes have also their nutritional value, but let's take, take a step further and think of where are these tomatoes coming from. So I think this is a really important aspect to also think about because whatever we are demanding from in the market is pulling on our food systems as well. And I feel on the nutrition side, um, food waste, these are all things I feel that could massively influence our food systems transformation. Any insights you have on consumer behavior and what we could do more going from COP27 to COP28? As I mentioned, I think that uh, we need to have that uh, big awareness campaign, even on the, not only on the dietary and the health impact, because even when we connected the FAST with the waste initiative, we had that nutrition initiative that focuses on how we are consuming. 
working on the food systems at the level of the school children and up to the level of the universities, I think would be very important because food is at the heart of the climate, biodiversity, land degradation, air, it's all connected and even to the health. This could make a huge difference in the future generation and how they are consuming. And by the way, the future generation now, different than our generation, is starting to think, to rethink of what do they eat, how do they eat it, and how many. And that is really something that would give us a boost if we were able even to use digitalization, and the UEE is very good at that, in linking the digitalization, the health, the awareness of the school children, that would really also be an important pillar maybe of the next COP. So just to let you all know, we are, as a, as a team for who's supporting the food systems transformation, due to all the consultation meetings we've had, starting in ONGA um, and then going to COP15, um, we are now putting together something which we feel will really kind of push the needle on food systems transformation. So I'm very excited because we've basically taken in all the inputs from all of you um, and seen what can be done. And you know, we started with a very simple question. What does success mean for food systems transformation at COP28? That's how we started. Because if we don't define what it is that we expect, then it's very difficult to judge after you finish COP, was it a good COP or was it a bad COP? So that's how we started, and having these consultation meetings, I think we're coming up with something really good, a framework for the global community when it comes to food systems transformation, because it's not, renewables for example, it's easy to put a percentage and say we want this much of our energy needs to be covered by renewables, but when it comes to food systems transformation, it's so difficult to define this. Uh, but with that, I want to thank you. Thank you thank for being you. here with us. Always a pleasure to see you.